Hey, good afternoon everybody and welcome to Pediatric Grand Browns. Um, just a couple of announcements before we get started. Please be sure to sign in. Um, the number is on the back table and kind of throughout the room and you want to call from your mobile phone and enter the code for this conference. Please do that even if you do not need CME credit because it helps us maintain our accreditation. And then don't forget to turn in your evaluation at the end of the talk. Um, you can turn those in to the CME table or just leave them on your table and we'll pick them up afterwards. So I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Kirthi Reddy. She is going to be talking with us today about um, peanut immunotherapy and kind of all the latest and greatest on that topic. Dr. Reddy was a graduate of the American University of Antigua College of Medicine, and she is, of course, one of our pediatric residents, is our chief pediatric resident this year. Um, during residency, she has um, received numerous awards for her teaching. So she has been elected um, Pediatric Resident of the Month for her teaching in clinical care several times. She's a Caduceus Award nominee by our medical students, and this year has been inducted into the AOA Honor Society as well as awarded the Gold Humanism Society um, Excellence in Teaching Award. She has done um, research in the area of allergy and immunology and her future plans include completing a fellowship in allergy immunology. Um, during her time here in residency, she has worked with um, Dr. Gonzalez Estrada and has several peer-reviewed publications and book chapters in submission for publication as well as a number of um, oral presentations and, and abstracts published. So um, thank you, Dr. Reddy, and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Skitsina. So my topic today um, is on food allergies and specifically um, peanut immunotherapy. So hopefully by the end of the presentation, you guys will at least know the basics of food allergy and a little bit um, about the up and coming treatments in food allergy and specifically peanut immunotherapy. So just want to let everyone know that I have nothing to disclose. I have no financial interest. I wish I did, but I do not. Um, so before we start, I have a case. Um, you're seeing a three-year-old girl and her five-year-old brother for a well child checkup. Um, both have food allergies. Her mother asks you what is the likelihood that they will outgrow their food allergies. What is the best response to her question? You guys are correct. Um, children with peanut allergies are not likely to outgrow the allergy. See, you guys don't even need me. You guys already know this. <laughs> um, but. Um, Kids with um, peanut allergy, usually um, only 20% of them outgrow their allergy, whereas milk, wheat, um, soy, and egg, they usually are outgrown at 80%. But, so before we go into detail about food allergies, we need to actually define food allergies and classify them. So the overall broad category is defined as adverse food reactions, um, which is basically any kind of abnormal reaction that you end up getting after you ingest a certain type of food. Um, now, they're further classified. Different sources say different things, but um, some sources are, they classify them into two different categories, which we'll talk about, and some sources define them into three different categories. So first, I'll talk about the three different categories. Um, the first one, um, first classification is toxic reactions. So a toxic reaction is basically where your outside source or your food has, the problem is coming from the food itself. So take scom scombroid, for example. It's because when you ingest it, it's because of the histidine molecule, molecule that's in it that's causing the reaction. Um, and sometimes phar pharmacological agents are also classified in that as well. For example, caffeine, you get reactions with caffeine or tyramine and the reactions that you get with that. Um, the next um, reaction is non-toxic reaction. Um, that's subclassified into two different reactions. And um, the first one is their hypersensitivity reaction, which of course is immune mediated um, re adverse reaction. And sometimes it's IgE mediated and sometimes it's not. Um, and then uh, your intolerance. So that's your non-immune -medi non mediated. And it's usually due to some kind of unique host property. 
Then the third one, which we're probably all familiar with from clinic, is your psychological. Um, so it would be your psychosomatic food aversion that you see mostly in autistic kids or those kids with um, sensory processing disorders. So now the two um, system classification is basically divided into immune mediated and then your non-immune mediated. So under your, under your immune mediated, you have your food allergies and your celiac disease, and that's further classified into, of course, your IgE mediated, which we all know is your acute urticaria and your oral allergy syndrome and so on and so forth. Um, your non-IgE mediated would be your food, in, food protein induced enteropathy and celiac disease. And your, then you have your mixed IgE and non-IgE mediated so an example of that would be your eosinophilic gastroenteritis that you might see, and then you have your cell-mediated, which is your allergic contact dermatitis. Um, as far as the non-immune mediated, um, that's primarily um, considered your food intolerances, and here they classify the toxic um, and the pharmacological agents under that category instead of having a classification of their own. Um, so your metabolic, so things like lactose intolerance, um, as well as your pharmacological, pharmacological such as caffeine, your toxo toxic reactions that we talked about earlier, and then there's also um, idiopathic, which would be an example, an example would be sulfites. So more about IgE-mediated food reactions. So of course, we all know that 90% of food reactions are caused by the eight most common foods, which are your milk, egg, peanut, tree nuts, fish, selfish, wheat, and soy. Um, usually symptoms are acute in onset and they occur usually within two hours of ingestion. Um, and we'll talk about a little more about clinical diagnosis later, but some of the symptoms you might see, of course, if you take your skin would be hives and angioedema. Um, from a GI system standpoint, vomiting and diarrhea. Um, respiratory, wheezing and shortness of breath, and of course cardiovascular, you would see hypotension. And of course, the most severe form is anaphylaxis, and you need to have at least two organ systems involved to be able to call it anaphylaxis. So more about the 80-20 rule that I was talking about earlier. So peanut allergy, of course, you're not likely to outgrow it. Only about 20% of children do outgrow it. Um, about 20 to 50% of patients with peanut allergy are also allergic to tree nuts. Um, and then you also want to make sure that Tree nuts may contain trace amounts of peanuts, especially because they're a lot of times they're processed together, so you want to make sure you tell your patients that. As far as cross-reactivity, um, peanut allergy patients with peanut allergies, they have a 10% um, cross-reactivity with other legumes, and as well as they have cross-reactivity about 25% um, of patients in tree nut allergy. So as far as epidemiology goes, unfortunately, there's not a lot, well, there is so many studies going on about it, but um, there's not a lot as far as if there's a predilection for whether it's females versus males or whether a certain race is more inclined to getting food allergies. But we do know that there's a range, actually, for um, the prevalence of food allergies at this point, which they say it's anywhere between 1% to 2% to actually 10%. Um, but the consensus seems to be that um, a lot of studies have shown that young children have um, an overall prevalence of about 6%. So you see it right there. And then adults have about 3.7%. Um, and that is in the US. Um, about 35% of all food allergies are actually self-reported. And about 20% of adults and children alter their diets um, for their, on their own for their perceived allergies. So if you look at the chart in children, uh, milk is the highest um, food allergy at 2.5%. Then comes milk at 1.3 and then peanut at 0.8. Um, and the next, um, for adults, shellfish um, it has the highest percentage at 2, um, then followed by peanuts and then tree nuts, fish, and so on and so forth. As far as risk factors for developing food allergies, of course, family history plays a role into it. Um, you want to make sure you ask whether they have any kind of asthma, your atopic dermatitis, your seasonal allergies, because that puts them at risk for it. As well as age, of course, infants and toddlers are more at risk for um, getting food allergies. And then um, a lot of children, if they've had a history of food allergies, suppose they've outgrown it, um, as adults, they are increased risk for getting other food allergies as well. And of course, they themselves, if they have asthma, eczema, or your allergic rhinitis or seasonal allergies, puts them at risk as well. 
from a socioeconomic standpoint in food allergies, um, they've noted that children, of course, in low, lowest socioeconomic, um, or the lowest income, um, had about two times, 2.5 times the amount of um, ED and hospital um, visits towards um, food allergies. And that's due to the fact that they were not able to get in to see specialists, of course, um, as well as they weren't able to um, pay for the out-of-pocket preventative measures that um, food allergies need. Um, and as far as African-American children, they had the lowest levels of direct medical, um, direct medical and out-of-pocket care. So the pathophysiology of food allergies is a debated topic because unfortunately there is a lot of discussion on what causes food allergies and no one really knows what does. Um, but recent studies have actually shown that there is an association with peripheral T regulatory cells. So um, what they did in the study was that they noted that individuals with food allergies, when they ingested any kind of, any kind of food or any kind of microbe, um, they did not have any kind of effect from the PT regulatory cells. Um, but those that did not have any food allergies, they did have a response from the peripheral T regulatory cells, increasing their immunity and, the, and hence not causing them to have food allergies. So, and remember this when we get to the immunotherapy standpoint. So, um, once again, as far as symptoms goes in clinical presentation, like we talked about earlier, um, IgE mediated versus non IgE mediated symptoms. So, as far as your IgE, you get your angioedema, you get hives, diarrhea, hypotension, and anaphylaxis. Um, as far as your non IgE mediated, you tend to get more GI symptoms. So, that's your nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, and then you do see poor weight gain, so you do have a lot of children present with failure to thrive, and of course, um, stateria and malabsorption. Um, and I like this chart because it kind of breaks down based on the spectrum of whether it's IgE or non-IG mediated on the symptoms that you would see. So as far as your IgE mediated, you have your um, if it's totally IgE mediated, you would have your urticaria, angioedema, and as far as your as far as your respiratory symptoms, you would see what, what you see in asthma and rhinitis, and then um, as far as your GI, you would have your GI anaphylaxis and oral allergy syndrome. Um, as far as in between, of course, your atopic dermatitis falls there, it falls there, and then your eosinophilic disorders, and then your non-IgE mediated would be your um, dermatitis hepatiformis, your Heiner syndrome, and um, enterocolitis, enteropathy, and prop. Pro Prococolitis celiac. So what's Heiner syndrome? So it is a milk-induced pulmonary disease. Mm -hmm. So as far as diagnosis, um, your main source is going to be through your history. Um, and then, of course, your physical exam. So when you ask your patient, you need to ask the amount of the food that was ingested. Um, what was the form of the food, and then, of course, were there, were there other foods that were co-ingested? Co um, your first um, line is going to be your skin, skin pricking, um, and that's going to detect for sensitization. Um, so you have, it has a false positive rate, about 50,000, and then um, an NPV of about greater than 90%. So you always want to start off your, with your skin pricking, not with your serum-specific IgE, which is your blood test, um, due to the fact that if you get the blood test without doing skin pricking and suppose the patient didn't have symptoms, you're kind of stuck because you don't know what to do with that test. So you always want to start off with skin pricking. Now, after you get your spring skin prick, um, it's nice to get your serum-specific IgE because that's what's going to help you decide whether you can oral, orally challenge this patient or not, depending on what your levels are. Um, As far as management, um, your avoidance measures are going to be your best friend. So dietary elimination will be your first line. Reading labels um, is one thing you're going to have to teach to your patients because they're not going to be used to it. Uh, making sure that there's no cross-contamination cross and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of patients do wear emergency bracelets. Um, and the Food Allergy Research and Education um, website is an amazing source for patients with food allergies as well as providers because you can find everything and anything there is on food allergies. 
Um, as far as your emergency medications, you want to instruct your patients on how to use self-injectable epinephrine. And especially if you have teenage patients, you also want to make sure that if they have friends to teach them as well, because if they're in a situation where they are not around, your par not around their parents, um, at least their friends can give it to them. Um, your second line, of course, would be your antihistamines as far as the medications go um, for the treatment of hives or any kind of puritis. And of course, you want to make sure that every patient has an emergency plan in writing for school or work. So last but not least, least um, oral food immunotherapy. That's what all the buzz is about in the allergy world at the moment. Um, right now, unfortunately, it is not FDA approved, but it is in the works. And it's only being done on a research basis. So it's only the big institutions like John Hopkins, Duke, and Baylor that are doing it right now. But we will get more into that. So, so these are kind of all the potential food allergy therapies that are currently being studied at the moment. So oral immunotherapy, it's currently being, it's on the FDA fast track designation. And we'll go through um, them in detail, at least three of them we will go through in detail. Um, but um, the next one would be oral immunotherapy with adjunct anti-IgE therapy, and that's off-label. So if you guys heard of Zolaire or, or Omadlizumab, um, that would be your adjunct anti-IgE therapy. Um, epicutaneous therapy, which is a patch, which is actually pretty cool that's being studied right now, um, is a patch that's being put on um, in place of actually giving the patient the uh, food orally but it's just being placed on a patch. Um, so sublingual therapy, immunotherapy, um, it's only been approved for specific antigens. And then of course you have your biological inhibitors. So oral immunotherapy. Um, so this is actually when you challenge the patient with the actual food that they are allergic to. So you first start off with really minute amounts of say peanuts. Um, it's almost a dusting of peanuts where you me measure it to the T. Um, and you start off with low amounts and you slowly increase it as they are able to tolerate it. Currently, there are about 30 plus clinical trials that are going on, and, but unfortunately, they're mostly in phase one and phase two trials. So that one of the trials that are going on right now that they've actually had a good response with is called AR101. Um, and this was a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled study. Um, they had about 550 uh, peanut allergic um, patients that were included in the study. Um, and the participants were between the ages of about four and 55. And what they found was that about 100% of their patients actually tolerated 443 grams, which is about the amount of two peanuts. And then about 78% tolerated one gram, which is about the amount that are, is in about a peanut butter cookie. So these kids that who were not able to eat peanuts before are able to at least start enjoying peanuts. Um, as far as possible biologics for peanut allergy, I know this is kind of a busy slide and it's a lot to take in, um, but there's a lot of uh, medications that are being put into use and in trying to figure out if they will be helpful um, in relieving peanut allergies. Um, one is a Bosatotria, um, and that is an anti-interleukin-5 um, M antibody, and that blocks interleukin-5 function, and it's currently in a phase three trial. Um, the next one is Synquil. Um, that's an anti-interleukin-5 um, MAB, and that's also in phase, I believe, sorry, two and three. Um, and Lebricizumab, which is an anti-interleukin-13, it blocks um, the interleukin-13 function, of course, and that's all um, in phase two and three as well. And then trilokinumab, which is um, anti-interleukin-13 as well, um, that's in phase two and three. And then you have the GSK679586, which is anti-interleukin-13 as well. And that neutralizes interleukin-13, and that's in phase two. Unfortunately, there wasn't very much data on um, how they are doing with these medications, so I really couldn't tell you guys other than they are working on it. <laughs> so this actually um, is probably the more up and, up and coming along with oral immunotherapies, epicutaneous immunotherapy or EPIT. Um, so this goes back to the pathophysiology that we were talking about. So what they found was that, that there was more T cells in the skin compared, the T regulatory cells um, there's more in the skin compared to the blood. 
So they found by putting these immunotherapy patches on the skin, it was inducing the FOXP3 T regulatory cells in increasing the tolerance to whatever they were ingesting. So there was a couple of trials. One was called the VIPE study. Um, and their end goal was basically to get um, individuals to be able to tolerate one gram of PO peanut um, using 250 microgram patches on the back. So this study was um, done over a year. It had about um, 550 patients as well between the ages of 6 and 55. Um, and they were able to about, and they didn't give percentages in that study either because it's still ongoing, but they found that they were able to attain that goal where patients were able to tolerate the one gram of PO um, peanut, and the only side effects or adverse effects were more local reaction from the skin patch. Um, they used a 50 microgram patch, a 100 microgram patch, as well as a 250 microgram, pa microgram patch. Um, and then you see it right there where that patch is. And they just place it on the back and they have to change it every day. So the VIPES ULFA study is a, one of, so they did it for a year, and then they created another study off of that um, to see if there was any difference in the percentages of um, patients um, having a better response if they did it over two years rather than one year with the patch. Um, they actually had a 96% compliance rate, um, and they said that they actually did have a benefit with it, um, benefit over two-year period, especially in kids between the ages of 6 to 11 years old. Um, and this was done with a 250 microgram dose patch. The COFAR-6, um, it's another one of the trials that is um, being done with the EPIT. Um, and this was similar to VIPES as, as well, but it's only comparing um, 100 versus a 250 microgram. And what they wanted to see was if they could, um, if the primary endpoint was to see if they could tolerate five grams of peanut rather than the one gram of peanut that VIPES was doing. And they don't really have very many results from that yet, so it's an ongoing trial. So with the EPIT trials, they found that it's very well tolerated. There was no serious adverse effects. Um, and they found that because it's through the skin and didn't go through the blood, that there was very few reactions to it. And that was the reason why they had few reactions. So there was actually no need for anyone to actually have epinephrine with it at all. Um, and they had no one had um, any kind of life-threatening life reactions. So some take home points. So um, sensitization through the skin starts pretty early. So if you have a kiddo that is high risk, um, you might need to intervene even on day of life zero. Uh, you wanna do the challenge quickly after you get a skin pricking test because it might not end up being re relevant. Um, and then most reactions that occur early on, um, they really actually do not need epinephrine. So conclusion, so as we know, food allergies, they are increasing in prevalence. The, actually, the new LEAP um, study guidelines uh, came out recently, and they actually said that if you have a patient that is high risk, and for them, high risk patients are considered to, considered to be patients with severe eczema or egg allergy, um, or both, they actually will benefit starting um, introducing peanuts at an early age at four to six months. Um, so I know that the American um, Board of Allergy and Immunology is actually working with the AAP now to get those guidelines changed so we can actually start introducing peanuts at four to six months. Um, so hopefully with more trials, the guidance will become more allergen specific and um, more age optimal and target populations more specifically. But unfortunately, there's not much out there at the moment. And that's really all I have. Mm -hmm. Even if they're not high risk, they actually say we should start introducing them. I had a granddaughter, and he said that to her, and he said, your pediatrician slash allergy is smart. My first case of allergy was an Indian girl that came from India and visiting uh, Texas. I was there, mm -hmm. and I was devastated. Because that kid did not make it. She was a 13-year-old, first time to be for peanut butter and chili pancakes. Yeah. It was it's sad. It's horrible. Daniel, Dr. Lewis. No, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering, like, what's the earliest you can do the skin test on a baby? So they usually say about one. 
is when you can start actually doing it. Some studies say you can start at six months, but most allergists say at one. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I think was just coming around when I went through med school, like that wasn't that long ago. But can you talk about how that mm -hmm. relates to allergy and immunology? F pies. <laughs> Ooh. Or if anybody in the audience. <laughs> so what is what is it? Well, it's like a food protein induced entero uh -huh. enterocolitis syndrome. And essentially the way it was described to me is that similar to food allergies, it's an exposure re-exposure thing. I'm assuming it's a hypersensitivity reaction, reaction but essentially yeah. it results in shock. So you, you eat whatever and you end up with a child in shock. What's the other problem she had? Well, this, uh, this child ultimately well, had this diagnosis and then was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So I learned about it that way. And I was like, is there any sort of a connection here? Is this going to be gut microbiota sort of stuff? I emailed this researcher in Sweden had one publication on eight kids with F5s, wow. and two of them went on to have type 1 diabetes. So hmm. I was trying to figure out if there's any connection. He said, I have no idea. So. Yeah. Off the plane. They really tell you you can't open peanuts on the plane, like the dust from those peanuts. Mm -hmm. really Go into the air and cause a reaction, cause yeah. Reaction. Do you have any comments or you know they So I know that they did have, um, there was a lot of cases where, um, where kids would, with peanut allergies, that's the reason why it all started, was because kids were on planes and they were getting um, anaphylaxis from the peanuts from the dust more so, and it would be that the, he would, be, there was actually one case where the individual that opened up the peanuts was all the way in front of the plane, but the dust actually migrated all the way to the back and the kiddo ended up having anaphylaxis. And he ended up being okay because mom knew what to do, but apparently the hostesses were, and the mom had made a comment saying that you need to take the peanuts off of the flight and they gave her trouble for it. But that it was through FAIR that they actually um, ended up fighting for it and they ended up getting it off the planes. So. Um, I, I remember a few years back when the recommendation came about to introduce peanuts from the AIII mm -hmm. or whatever, to introduce peanuts at the age of four to six months for high-risk children. Uh, there was a lot of controversy at the time because that was uh, a recommendation against sort of exclusive breastfeeding until six months of age, which is classically been the AAP's recommendation. Uh, and I remember there was much sort of kerfuffle over that. <laughs> Has there been any sort of co coming together of those two recommending bodies or with regards to stuff like this yet? Yeah. I, I am not sure if there was or not, but I think, Dr. J. Yeah. Not the high risk kids. And in fact, to be a little cautious with the high risk kids. So if there's a strong family history of atopy or if there's a strong asthma component to the child, to actually reserve those to be done by allergists or to <coughs> there is still the potential of a peanut allergy. But to have sort of a more standard, everybody gets this early. Um, there's not a consensus, I think, between the two bodies, but there's all kinds of formulations out there, peanuts of various forms, like peanut toothpaste, peanut, mm -hmm. know, <laughs> peanut gels of various kinds that you can use, but now families are finding and coming back and asking. Um, Did the mother eat peanuts? Did she breastfeed her I know they're actually doing a study on that, and if a mom was eating peanuts, how many, how much peanut does she have to actually consume in order for it to be helpful for the baby? But I know they are working on it. But the sensitized APPs were recommended across the board for everybody, mm -hmm. not for the high risk kids. Mm -hmm. <coughs> also, these severe atypic kids, like infants.
So from what I understand is probably send them to allergy first and so that they, especially if they're high risk, um, so that they can at least do an oral challenge on them and make sure that they do okay and don't have a reaction to it. Sorry, Dr. Wood. Uh, no. I, I missed the whole talk. I'm sorry. I apologize. It came late, but how about rash testing on those kids? Is that equally as So skin breaking is the first line, of course. And then blood testing, you don't want to do that first, a RAS testing, because if you end up doing RAS testing and they don't have any symptoms with a certain food, then you're stuck and you don't know what to do with them. If you do skin pricking and then you get your IgE levels, that helps you because if you end up wanting to do an oral ch challenge later, then you look at the levels and based on the levels, you start introducing the foods back into their diet. So always do skin pricking first. Great job. Thank you.